Hello and welcome to this Almanac North special. I'm Robin Washington. We continue tonight a new program on issues facing our community. We're calling it the Almanac North Focus on Specials, in-depth discussions to help create a community dialogue. You will see different hosts as the series continues and conversations designed to educate and challenge all of us to be better. Tonight's focus is art as a response to racism. Our first guest is Warren Reed. Warren is the author of The Lyncher in Me, A Search for Redemption in the Face of History. It's a memoir he wrote after his shocking discovery that his great-grandfather was a central figure responsible for the lynching in Duluth of Elias Clayton, Elmer Jackson, and Isaac McGee. It's also the story of finding healing, particularly from those connected to the victims of his ancestors' horrific crime. Thank you for being here tonight, Warren. Thank you for having me. So yours is an extraordinary story. You were doing basic research on your family's history, and this was pretty much the early days of the internet, and your great-grandfather's name popped up. Uh, tell me what that was like and what you found. Well, I, um, you know, I, I had been really just focused on family tree information, trying to get a sense of who my ancestors were, and certainly didn't expect to find out anything notable. Um, but uh, one night I happened to do a search on my great grandfather's, um, well, on my mother's maiden name, Don Dino, and um, an article came up that outlined the lynchings in 1920 Duluth. And um, I didn't see his name right away, but I knew that it had come up for some reason. And um, what I remember is when I saw his name as, as uh, one of the key people that led the, uh, the mob down to the jail, um, my first, my first impulse was to try to explain it away as a coincidence um, that it couldn't possibly be him. But, you know, it didn't take long for me to realize. I mean, it was a, it's an unusual name and the age was right and the location was right. So it was it was shocking, to say the least, for sure. Right. This was article was the article by Heidi Bach Hansen in the short lived uh, alternative paper, The Ripsaw, in about 2000. And uh, for those who don't know, I want to quickly go through the story of the lynching, which is that the men lynched were three uh, black traveling circus workers. They were accused of raping 19 year old Irene Tuscan uh, from West Duluth. And uh, as I always tell the story, I have to quote the doctor who examined her the very next day and said uh, that there was no sign of sexual assault. So the accusation was that there were actually six black circus workers that allegedly raped her. Uh, three men were taken from the old city jail in Duluth and hung from a lamppost at First Street and Second Avenue East. And there were as many as 10,000 people in the crowd. So when you search for information about them 80 years later, uh, you would, uh, or when you search for information about your family, rather, 80 years later, you came up largely blank except for one fine, and <laughs> we discussed that part, so. Um, well, what did you find out about the uh, victims of the crime? Well, I, I didn't find out anything for quite a while. Um, my initial response when I went through was really just trying to reconcile what what we knew about or what we believed about my great grandfather and my mother's relationship with him and really kind of what that meant for our family and and how we could um, support the memorial that they were doing in Duluth to the three men that were lynched um, it wasn't until after that that um, that I really really was pushed to see what I could find out about the 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 men who were lynched. And I didn't really expect to find anything because people had looked for quite a while. But then, like you said earlier, it was the early days of the internet. And so more and more things were, were suddenly being found online. And um, eventually I found that Elmer Jackson, one of the men who was lynched, was born in a freed slave settlement in Missouri, a town called Pennytown. And um, coincidentally enough, there were descendants of the people who lived there who still gathered every year and so that was an opportunity for me to see if i could connect with someone from his family mm -hmm. and what was their reaction when you did make that connection how did you make that connection 
Well, I, um, it was, it was a very kind of odd series of events that actually made that connection in, um, just taking a little bit of information from Elmer Jackson's death certificate, I was able to do some census research and see the names of the people in his family. And then coincidentally, um, there is a, an old church on the site of the freed slave settlement that's in the historical register. And the article about that online actually had a snapshot of Elmer Jackson's family um, as one of the people who lived here. And that was really odd because they had, you know, over 40 families that lived there. And this was a family they highlighted. Um, so that really provided that connection. And through that, um, I connected with a woman named Virginia Houston, who is the caretaker of that church and the project. Um, and I, you know, I reached out to her by email first to just kind of let her know our story and what I'd learned about Elmer. And she was very gracious and interested in the history of it. And from there, we talked on the phone and I went there to visit and um, we've become very good friends. Right. And and we're, as we've got her, yeah, so we actually found out, we actually found that she is an offshoot relative of Elmer Jackson, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. uh, we're just looking at a picture of the two of you uh, at the National Memorial for Peace and Justice, uh, the opening of it actually uh, uh, two years ago in Montgomery, Alabama. And this is also informally known as the Lynch, uh, National Lynching Memorial. Um, but uh, you've met a few times before, and in fact, you give presentations together. Yeah, she, um, she like I said, she's been wonderfully gracious, and I think I don't know what what I would have done if our paths hadn't crossed. It was a lot for us to figure out as a family. It was a lot for me to figure out as a parent, as as a descendant of someone who did something like this. Um, and I, you know, I just remember at the time, my initial emotion was just overwhelming guilt, but no real explanation about that guilt because obviously I wasn't there when it happened. Um, but she was um, just really generous and understanding and really kind of walked alongside me um, as our friendship grew to help me kind of process this. And I know she's come to Duluth uh, with me to see the memorial and then to be able to see the, the National Memorial was, was really powerful to be able to do that with her. Mm -hmm. And to give people an idea uh, just how much she does, I, I think I have to say the word treasures you. Uh, when I met the two of you at the National Memorial, she referred to you as her baby brother. <laughs> she does. Yeah, it's yeah, I love her dearly. She's an amazing person. Right. Did you ever imagine a relationship like that would happen when you sent that email in the first place? No, not at all. And, you know, and I I really didn't have any idea of how she would even respond. Um, I, you know, I found the old emails and I was kind of amused at how very business like they were between she and she and me. Um, and um, because I, I think I was just wanting to give her the, the, the information. I didn't really know really uh, I, I, like how I was supposed to feel or what I was even really wanting from her. Um, and like I said, she was very polite and very receptive. And it wasn't until later when we talked on the phone that the warmth really started to, to come up between us. And um, she, you know, she acknowledged that this is a part of the history that's very real and very ugly. And, um, you know, she and I are on the same page in the sense that there's nothing we can do about what's already happened, but we have a responsibility um, as humans to um, try to change the course right of, of what's happening uh, our focus uh, tonight on focus is art as a response to racism so writing emails is one thing talking on the phone uh but you decided to write a whole book on this and i also take it you're not completely done on that uh, artistic yeah. endeavor but y you got the book out as we've introduced yeah. it the lyncher and me uh what was that process like and i assume a catharsis but can you ever really achieve something like that yeah, that's a good question. I think it's definitely been a journey. It's It's been an evolution. And I think about where I was at the time that I wrote it and where I am now, it's it's a bit different. Um, I think at the time, really, I was like kind of going through a jungle trying to figure out, you know, what 
what this meant um, about our family. It was it was really a way to kind of turn things inside out and and take a closer look at us as a family. And um, you know, I, I look at it from the standpoint of this event in 1920 was like a wound, and a lot of people tried to keep it covered and not acknowledge it. And we know that if you do that, a wound doesn't have a chance to heal. And so a lot of my writing process was looking at a couple of different things, looking at how did this wound impact my family um, through the generations, the choices that people made, um, the, the poison that happens when people just don't talk about things and try to keep them hidden and how that just in, infects relationships. Um, there was that piece. And then also that realization of, you know, here was this man that my mother idolized I didn't know him. I heard lots of stories about him growing up. And here's this very ugly truth about him and what he did. And it was that realization that um, there is no real black and white as far as like all evil and all good. That In all, all people. Shaped. Right, right. Yes. Yeah, that we're so all. I, I want to go back right. to um, and we'll have people read the book and find out more about your great grandfather. Uh, but mm -hmm. as far as uh, you particularly are concerned in um, again, until Heidi Bach Hansen wrote the article in 2000, the names Irene Tuscan, Jimmy Sullivan, her boyfriend, were all hidden. Uh, and Dondino's not a usual name, is not in Duluth anymore. You live in the Seattle area. You could have ignored this. Um, on the other hand, the Tuscan family includes Mike Tuscan, who is now our chief of police, who um, the irony is you are more of a direct descendant of Dondino, and Mike is more indirect. Uh, he's that was his great aunt. Um, so how do you reconcile or can you reconcile or, you know, did you have a responsibility, do you feel, to uh, claim this? You could have easily walked away. And there we have a picture of the three of you, Mike, uh, Virginia and yourself very quickly. Yeah, um, I think I definitely could have just ignored it or, or dealt with it just within our family. I think if I came across the story and it was just a an article I dug up and there was nothing else about it, we would have dealt with it as a family. Um, but I, the fact that that the community was building this memorial that I knew probably was at least a little controversial, um, that was really, I think, the impetus to, to get us more involved in, and in stand behind it. And you rose to the occasion. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, Thank you. Warren Reed, the author of The Lyncher and Me, a descendant of Louis Dandino, who was an instigator of the lynching in Duluth. So today we're we're shedding a, a light on our young African heritage men. We want to make sure that we come in and support them. We have our young African heritage men are being supported by the Duluth Grill Family Restaurant, and we're going to serve a lot of food today. And and it's free, so you know have people come on down and and a fellowship with their guys. Here we all stand in this sacred ground, this sacred special place. They gather to murder three people, Elias Clayton, Elmer Jackson, and Isaac McGee. They were individuals and they had lives, they had families. And so we cannot forget because it's still, it's happening today. It's happening today. So whenever anybody gets a chance to come down the memorial, say their names out loud because people need to know who these men were.
Joining us now in the studio is Mary Villard. Mary is a visual artist who most recently worked on a mural project in conjunction with the centennial of the lynching in Duluth of Elias Clayton, Elmer Jackson, and Isaac McGee. Mary, uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, I want to give you an opportunity to tell us about the mural, uh, which I know is about the death of uh, George Floyd while in police custody in Minneapolis. And it also happened to coincide with the 100th anniversary of the lynching in Duluth. And if that weren't enough, <laughs> uh, Juneteenth, uh, which had its commemoration at the same time. Right. Yeah. So. Um, the Mural Project was kind of an idea uh, that came about, um, I guess, when I recognized that I think people were looking to activate the space more at, at the Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial. Um, and one of the things that I do in my artistic practice is really just focusing on, on ways to activate space. Um, and so I reached out to Dan Sand Creatives um, and the Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial after the, the spray painting that had happened there. Um, and I just offered my facilitation skills and um, offered to do something. Giving and art a sort of direction. Right, yep, right. exactly. Right. Um, you mentioned the spray painting, so for those who don't know, the uh, memorial was uh, spray painted in two locations, actually, uh, two different handwritings, uh, so that implies two different people. On the day, it was actually the afternoon of the it becomes a blur, uh, the mm -hmm. first large protest uh, mm -hmm. in response to the death of George Floyd. And uh, that sparked a lot of different reactions in the community. Uh, for many, the memorial itself is sacred. I mentioned, by the way, Mike Tuscan, uh, who being an indirect descendant of the woman who instigated the lynching or right. started it, uh, or, or certainly had a great deal of responsibility, he says he finds it a place of solace. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, the, it goes for uh, so many different people. Um, on the other hand, the young man, and uh, one of them was identified, I don't know if the second one, Tagger, if you will, was identified, um, was, uh, uh, I'm told, African American, and was responding to the police, his message in, code I don't quite understand and uh, up on all my graffiti uh, was uh, uh, strongly condemning the police. So for those who wanted him to be arrested or entered into the criminal justice system, you had this irony of he's making a statement uh, in a form of art about the police and yet he would be turned over to the police. Uh, luckily that didn't happen. Right. Uh, what are your thoughts about that? You know, I think um, I think stuff like that happens and, and you know I'm not the person that did it or from the background of the person that did it um, but I think you know for young folks um, having space is important and you know as an adult now you know one of the things that I wanted to offer was that option because you know there is spray paint and that is a form of um, of resistance in some ways um, but there's other ways that are less accessible. Like, uh, I, I feel like, you know, youth wouldn't have had that option to create murals, you know, to have those supplies there on their own without, you know, adults in the community stepping up and creating that space um, for them to use their voices in the way that they want to. So when yeah. I was, you know, facilitating, facilitating that process, um, I invited Carla Hamilton, uh, Delphin Starr, um, two great African-American painters in the community. Um, and, and we really designated that space for young folks and for um, indigenous and black folks to, to kind of come together and without a filter, you know, put whatever they have to say on, on those canvases that were there. And, you know, it's kind of interesting when you have, um, you know, a lot of people were asking me if I was worried that people were gonna write profanity all over the, the place or really like get angry in that space. But uh, art includes profanity exactly. sometimes. Right, right. And, and for me, it was like, well, maybe, you know, if that happens, maybe the space isn't any longer, you know, the Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial, but there's another place for, for that work to be. That doesn't mean we have to stop people from, you know, writing what they feel. Um, but there's just kind of that interesting thing where when people are working collaboratively, um, or when people feel a sense of ownership, I guess, of something, um, there's just this silent energy that goes between everyone as they're working on stuff where they don't have to, they don't have to plan it, they don't need restriction. Um, but the artwork kind of
comes to life. And, and that's what art does, right? Yeah. Art, uh, uh, when it's particularly unplanned and doesn't have restriction, it may be, it's my opinion, and everybody has an opinion on art, art, but uh, it's purest form. Right. Right. Um, I don't want to harp on it, I do, but I do want to go back to the graffiti uh, because on the one hand, in, in a way, we're here talking about it because uh, we're here talking about the art because of the graffiti. Mm -hmm. Graffiti is, for better or for worse, a legitimate art form. It certainly is a form of expression. Um, it made perfectly good sense, if you think about it, for both the people who uh, performed the graffiti that day to do so on that day because um, there were at least a thousand people uh, who were there right before the, they tagged, if you will. Right. Um, uh, so it certainly got attention and it certainly got a message out. Um, but um, again, there were people who uh, the art of the memorial has its own message uh, and, and people who felt strongly that that should be inviolate and never touched, if you will. Um, so it's evolved, and I noticed now, I was just there a few hours ago, um, that there's uh, chalk. In fact, it's been there for the last um, couple weeks now, uh, which is perfectly removable. The graffiti, by the way, was removed. Anyone who's worried about that took actually just 20 minutes or something. Apparently, the city knows how to do this. <laughs> um, and the chalk is, I think, um, transformed the memorial into now an interactive art space. Yeah, definitely. I think um, even after we completed the initial three murals, uh, Stefan Witherspoon went and got another um, panel for people to write on and to continue to add to. I mean, that was and a I think that was the evolution after that. Exactly. People found the surface in the chalk, right? Yeah, a few days later, Carla and Stefan had reached out and just wanted to make sure, you know, what, what supplies they could use on the, the panels and put another one out there. And that was the goal, you know, was to really just activate that space. And for me, you know, I have a, a certain set of skills, <laughs> you know, that I contributed, but really it was the community coming together and making that happen and directing uh, the way they wanted it to go. Um, even, you know, I, I have to mention Dolphin again, coming up with the, uh, there's a, a fist with an American flag in it that is in, in the painting of George Floyd. Um, and Sandra Oyenloy was the one who suggested that we should add Breonna T Taylor um, to the- I was there when that was added, right? Yeah, I saw that. Right, to the design. Right. Um, and again, Delphin's idea was to add, to allow people to write the names of people who are victims of police brutality. And it just became this, you know, all these ideas just bouncing off of each other. Yeah. Right. And so the three murals are there, or is it four that you say now? Or? Yeah, there's three, and then there's We're a fourth count. one that right. is just a, a free form panel, I think, that people are going up to on their own time to add to. Sure. And uh, are there plans to move them somewhere else or for, uh, you know, when I see the picture constantly of the, where the Cup Foods uh, market mm. was, where Mr. Floyd uh, died um, or was killed, um, I, I, there's, it, it looks similar to mm. your mural. And I, I don't mean yours personally, but to our mural, let's yeah. put it that way. Yeah, definitely. I mean, um, that's, I guess, the skill that I wanted to offer was, you know, I felt like people wanted a space to commemorate and, you know, the, the image of the people that you're commemorating um, is really powerful, as you see with, you know, the Clayton Jackson McGee, McGee Memorial as a whole as this representation of actual people. Um, and so I really just wanted to, to contribute that and, and allow people to, to direct what kind of memorial that would be, whether it would be messages, you know, um, in mourning or, or messages of right. um, social change, all of that, it could all kind of come together. We knew the centennial was coming. The original plan was to have 10,000 people there in response to the 10,000 people who were there 100 years before right. for the wrong reason. Yeah. Uh, we ended up with 1,000 and then another 1,000 um, with no idea that this would become an interactive art space and really a gathering spot uh, for protests. Where do you think, what, what, what do you think will be um, happening at the memorial next year? Or would you even venture a guess? You know, I would just love to see more sp space in general. You know, the memorial is that is that first step of like carving out a space for, you know, African heritage folks in the community, but there there needs to be more space and more space for people to act, be activated right. um, inside of. So All right, well, we'll see you then next yeah. year, right? <laughs> and in the meantime, thank you so much, Mary Villard.
Yeah, thank you. And I want to thank both of our guests for joining me on this Almanac North Focus on Systemic Racism. Our plan is to continue this conversation in the coming weeks as we focus on the challenge of racism and the equitable society for all of us. I'd like to thank the visual artists, again, Mary Villard, who generously shared the image used at the beginning of tonight's program. As was stated before, it was a community mural, it is a community mural project, organized by Mary. The murals are adjacent to the Clayton Jackson McGee Memorial in downtown Duluth. Follow Almanac North on our social media sites for the latest updates and news about our next Focus On special. You'll find us on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. You can watch this and other Almanac North programs on our website, wdsc.org, or find us on the PBS app. For our crew in the studio, I'm Robin Washington. Thank you for watching.